American Cult Christianity, Part 29. Why are there so many strange American cults today? The Assault on the Gospel Essential of Justification by Faith Alone. Hello, this is Joe Franklin of SparrowMinistry.com. This is a continuation of my new YouTube series on American cults and their beginnings. This ongoing and vital series called American Cult Christianity asks the question, why are there so many strange American cults today? Again, the short answer is the assault on the gospel essential of justification by faith alone. This aspect of our salvation and foundational gospel truth is the number one target of the enemy and has been ever since the church began on the day of Pentecost. And we've been uh, learning about a number of non-Christian cults and cults of Christianity that were birthed during the Second Great Awakening in 19th century frontier America. All of these groups still infect the Christian church today with far too many Christians being unable to understand just what is it that makes these groups unorthodox? Well, let's find out. Disclaimer, this YouTube channel is dedicated to the study of controversial groups and movements, some that have been called cults. SparrowMinistry.com uh, Also, just of note, Thomas and Alexander Campbell were Scot-Irish immigrants, and history names them as the co-founders of the Restoration Movement, along, of course, with Walter Scott and Barton Stone. Expect to hear guest appearances from them in the remaining slides in the series. Grammar can be a little bit granular and boring, and I'm simply wanting to liven it up a little bit. Hope you don't mind. All right, the grammar of Acts 2.38, part one. Now, we've already dealt with the theology of Acts 2.38, and uh, theology guides the grammar, right? So, all righty, so lexical objections, dealing with the definitions uh, and meanings of words. Let me adjust my screen. Yeah, so dealing with the definitions and meanings of words. And words do have meaning. I don't want to minimize grammar. Okay, lesson outline, 2 Peter 3.16. All righty, these are the scripture twisters. So top to bottom, any conclusion that baptism is necessary for salvation is faulty, is a faulty interpretation and contradicts the rest of scripture, middle restoration movement and the restorationism cults teach that the gospel was lost, whoa, and then restored by Alexander Campbell in 1823 and implemented by Walter Scott in 1827. It's, it's over there. It's in the corner of me. Bar. It's over there. It's lost. It's, go get it. Okay. Whoa. Pop-up gospel. All righty. To the right of that, ha uh, hyper-sacramentalism. And these are ritualists. Uh, they teach that baptism is for in order to obtain the literal remission of past sins. This water gospel says that baptism causes the remission of sins. No believer's baptism allowed, even though that's the only New Testament baptism that I know of in the entire New Testament. Not allowed. Okay. Whoa. And the red letter, letters, and they should be in red. These are serious false teachings of a false gospel. Um, is baptismal regeneration is not a Bible teaching, and that's also known as baptismal justification. And uh, baptismal regeneration is also a false gospel. That's all the same with them. Okay, at the very bottom, the in order to obtain reference word ice, that little green, Greek word, and we're talking about, uh, we're dealing with definitions and meanings here, so it's going to take on some new shape. Well, that would violate salvation by grace, so la grazia. The in order to obtain reference word ice uh, violates salvation solely by faith, sola fide, okay? And then, of course, if we add to the work of Christ, you know, baptism, Sabbath keeping, headdresses, snake handling, whatever you're into, well, then we take away from the sufficiency of the cross, okay? Lower left, bottom, nearly a dozen other cults adopted Alexander Campbell's distortion of New Testament baptism in the 1800s. Joseph Smith of the Mormons actually stole Campbell's plan of salvation on baptism, and the Mormons teach it to this very day. Okay, so some comments. 
Hey, enter the scripture twisters and no, this is not a game from Hasbro. <laughs> Ignorant and unstable people are distorting the scriptures. Okay, this is deadly spiritual warfare, but we have the guardrails, the five solas. Seventh day Adventist distorted Daniel and some other key passages. International Churches of Christ, that's the cult that I came out of. Well, they distorted Matthew 28 19. Go make disciples. Now, the Great Commission, all right? And here we have the Churches of Christ, Restoration Movement, distorting Acts 2.38. Churches of Christ and Restoration Movement is built upon Alexander Campbell's interpretation of Acts 2.38. That is where they got their five-step so-called plan of salvation. The Five Steppers. So the Church of Christ appeals to Greek grammar to save their baptismal theology. So, you know, they wouldn't get past the five souls. They can't deal with that. They fall apart. Wheels are coming off the bus. And then, of course, uh, we dealt with the theology of Acts 2.38. Whew! There's no wheels on the bus at all. It's just a band. I abandon ship me, buckos! Every man for himself, right? So they're going to appeal to grammar to save their baptismal theology now and their water gospel. They want to save that water gospel too. So this is their one last Hail Mary and their Alamo. They can't defend their five-step plan of salvation, which is a creed, an unwritten creed, by the way. I, you got me on that one, me bucko. <laughs> Whoa, Alexander Campbell, guest appearance. Whoa, <laughs> decaf. All right, so remember the Church of Christ claim, no creed but Christ, man. <laughs> no creed but Christ. Well, that's a creed. How about their insistence that baptism is a component of salvation? Hi, you better not challenge me, water gospel, or I'll put in Davy Jones' locker for that. <laughs> well, whoa. And so then they turn to more legalese and confusion. I mean, instrumental cause. And I'll hit you with the triple C, the copulative coordinating conjunction. You lily-livered free gracer. I, this is easy believism run amok. <laughs> Whoa, okay. <laughs> Whew. Well, with one last chance and gasp to confuse the public about their false man-centered gospel and salvation, they mount their attack. So this is their last David Copperfield moment, folks, as the ritualist will inevitably find the scripture to accommodate his or her ritual. But we know that restorationism is not a physical battle, but rather spiritual. The enemy is unseen. The devil's main goal is to confuse people regarding the gospel and keep them from enjoying their relationship with God. No, no good news here. Semi good news at the best. Anyhow, there's no shortcuts, loopholes, or religious rituals that can achieve salvation. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The, rough, the reformers figured that out. That's the Reformation. Okay, so nearly all false teaching in the church vectors back to a failed methodology here. So anyhow, failed methodology for understanding the Bible. It all vectors back to that, right? So obviously the heart is the breeding ground for unrighteousness as well. Don't want to forget that. So in terms of Bible study, there is, number one, the deductive approach. Two, the inductive approach. That's exegesis. That's good. And three, mm, the opinion approach, known as eisegesis. Ooh. That's what Church of Christ co-founder uh, Campbell relied upon in determining the meaning of Acts 2.38. I said Jesus is people seeking only to confirm what they believe and ignore the texts that don't support or confirm what they believe. So that explains why modern day Campbellites dismiss the gospel accounts where Jesus forgive, forgave sins through faith alone. Oh, that's pre-Pentecost. That doesn't count. <laughs> okay, whoa. All right, well. Eisegesis, not true, but whatever. Eisegesis explains why the Church of Christ deny the thief on the cross was really saved. He wasn't really saved. Jesus hasn't risen from the dead yet. Eisegesis explains why they accuse other Christians of having a dead faith unless that faith expresses itself in the waters of their correct baptism for the literal remission of sins. Well, 
all 19th century cults reject the clear Bible doctrine known as saving faith unless other requirements or conditions are met. It's the heresy of conditionalism. That's what this whole series is about, and other things, of course. The Church of Christ and other cults insist on reading Acts 2.38 Acts 2.38 at face value. Man, you got to read it at face value. And this is called a plain reading of the text that ignores context and author intent. To see just how dangerous this methodology really is, I refer to others. States Dr. Mark Strauss, vice chair of the NIV Study Bible Committee, Committee and an expert Bible translator. So he's going to deal with this just me and my Bible nonsense. Quote, the power is not in the words. The power is in the message. You can't just read the Bible at face value. End of quote. Keep it simple. But that's exactly what the Church of Christ and many, in, and many cults insist one must do. They read Acts 2.38 according what, to what's called a plain reading. Well, this is foolish. The great theologian C.H. Spurgeon said of those who hold to a plain reading that they also dismiss the scholarly work of the giants of the faith of ages past when they pontificate on Bible meaning. In other words, they are anti-theological. Sound familiar? That's the enlightenment in a nutshell, folks. This is 19th century cult Christianity, folks. Like little children, they put their fingers in their ears. I can't hear you, na 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 I can't hear you, to the five solas and justification by faith. We must consider context, context, context. Concerning the churches of Christ, it is my contention that their conclusions on Acts 2.38 miss the very nature and purpose of God. Likewise, their interpretation of the text misses the story of God's plan of redemption. The Restoration Movement cults show themselves to lack a clear, broader understanding of God. They employ a rule book, legalistic and patternistic approach when reading the Bible. Again, Dr. Mark Strauss, the power is not in the words, the power is in the message. Praise God. So let's not forget our history. The Restoration Movement and Enlightenment thinking sought to see God through a scientific lens void of theology, creeds, and dismissive of the scholarly work of the giants of the faith of ages past. Rubbish of ages! That's what Campbell said of all the scholarly work. I just mean my Bible. <laughs> Those turncoats. Let me debate them. Free gracers and the easy believisms. Whoa, whoa. Campbell was a magnet for rebels and other instigators and gospel haters at the time. Little has changed for his followers today, the modern day Campbellites. They're at war with Orthodox Christianity. All these cults still claim to be the one true church while holding to the falsehood that all other denominations are apostate and damned, Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, and otherwise. And as I've said previously, sometime after that 1809 famous declaration and address, uh, Campbell discovered what he believed was the true design and meaning of baptism. Okay, this discovery would have a significant impact on the progress of his unity movement, that being sheer chaos. Enlightenment thinking saw the 1800s as the ultimate changing point in history. Okay, this was their resurrection. <laughs> the winds that blew into the church during the 1800s looked to reason, logic, and freedom of thought over dogma, religious creeds, and faith anchored in essential doctrines. <laughs> Throw out the essential doctrines. All right, throw them all out. Just me and my Bible, rubbish of ages. <laughs> okay, whoa. Anyhow, the subtle error of Christian justification through works became their filter and lens. This was the magic key that unlocked true spirituality. 
One simply had to stick their head in the sand and put their fingers in the ears and, cons and, could, and they could soar above all the rancor and division in the church at the time. Dismissing the great creeds and confessions that tended to divide were paramount, paramount in establishing this new utopia. Acts 2.38 is not just a passage for the Church of Christ and other cults, but a magical passage way into an entirely new way to get saved by H2O, by a ritual. This is their Gnostic style secret and claim to fame. Ah, they're always after me lucky charms. Me marshmallows have pink hearts, yellow moons, orange stars, and green clovers. Okay, Mr. Campbell, whoa. I, uh, you theology lover too. And then they'll go on and on about how baptism saves and how people somehow contact the blood and the water as Jesus scrubs away our sins. And they'll reference Titus 3, 5 and Revelation 1, 5. But where's the book, chapter, and verse for contacting the blood? <laughs> Get him, boys! He's gotten too far in questioning the Lord's church. Oh, whoa, okay. All righty. But as I said earlier, uh, the, ritual, the ritualist will inevitably find the scripture to accommodate his ritual. In this case, Titus 3, 5, taking that out of context in Revelation 1, 5. Once a legalist loses a battle on one front, eh, he simply moves to another front without self-reflection or learning anything. They just want to win the argument, don't they? These, this is like the idol builders of Artemis, man. Just protect that idol. Idols of doctrine, right? Anyhow, these Pharisees are tone deaf to the true inward spirituality, okay? Tone deaf. So this is about justification and imputation outside of anything we do, finishing up here. The Campbellite plan of salvation and ancient gospel discovery of Acts 2.38 is their loophole. It's their excuse not to live by faith. No trust here. They are in love with their own obedience. Anyhow, this is a fundamental denial of the sufficiency of Jesus' work on the cross. This workaround and supplement is Galatianism. I'll have you dance in the, dance in the hemp and jig for that and bury you in Davy Jones' locker. <laughs> well, Pharisees get upset when you point to their Pharisaism. Okay, so here's our commergent. And uh, what is he saying there? Aye, we're the only game in town. We're restoring the church and the gospel. Okay, all right. So the main verb. Okay, so let, let, me, let me go through this. This is Acts 2.38 in the grammar. Acts 2.38 in the New International Version. And that's what I like to read. Uh, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is a breakdown of how the Church of Christ teaches in a half dozen or more other cults. Repent and be baptized. Well, they just look at that word baptized, which is a work. Be baptized for, and in their view, it's in order to get, which would be an ex equitable exchange view. If I do this, then I get that, right? Transactional view of God. <laughs> this person misunderstands the nature of grace and salvation. This is the heresy of conditionalism, right? Religion has just given you a bunch of little things to do in order to be saved. But it's in order to get the literal forgiveness of your sins. That's the restoration mo uh, movement view. It contradicts scripture, okay? And that Greek little word, ice, it's uh, for, it's a preposition, and it's forgiveness, by the way, in the sense of regeneration. And Campbell spoke of uh, baptism uh, as being equivalent to re regeneration. He went on and on about it being regeneration. So it's not a slur, it's the truth. That's what this group teaches, believes. They don't like that term? Well, so, so sad. <laughs> so Church of Christ teach. The Greek term ice is found about 1,750 times in the New Testament. While it has a variety of meaning shades, it always is perspective forward looking and is never retrospective backward looking in its direction. And that's from the ChristianCourier.com and hundreds of other Church of Christ websites. They all say basically the same thing. Further down, Church of Christ teach the word translated for in this verse basically means in order to get or for the purpose of obtaining. 
and is always forward looking. Back, baptism causes the literal remission of sins. It is the time, moment, and place of salvation. They consider baptism to be a sacrament and an ordinance. They'll argue that too, but sorry, <laughs> it's a sacrament. That's that's where grace is dispensed in their uh, in their doctrine. Again, they have a transactional view of God, very Old Testament. A Bible response, the Church of Christ, and about a dozen other 19th century cults, excuse me, are absolutely wrong in their attempt to add works to salvation, and especially in their claim to be the only true church. New birth baptism, aka baptismal regeneration, conflicts with Protestant and evangelical Christianity. Faith is opposed to work faith is opposed to works of any kind for salvation okay for salvation this is yet another iteration of the roman catholic heresy of saved by faith plus works for faith to be effectual aka work salvation this will take you captive and leave you empty and powerless okay so uh, some comments here church of christ is infamous for their dishonest and misleading canned arguments. Legendary. They are victims of error first, promoters of error second. Here is where the restoration movement used their dishonest interpretation of Acts 2.38 to break salvation into a process. Really important. This passage is their blueprint and formulaic oracle or creed. Hear, believe, confess, repent, be baptized for the remission of sins, and the Holy Spirit is given at the very end, which of course contradicts conversion in the Bible. This contradicts the order of salvation as well. Bible Christians are born again and regenerated the moment they exercise saving faith, John 1, 12, Ephesians 1, 13, and many, many others. They are sealed, forgiven, and adopted the moment they turn to Christ in repentant faith. So with this so-called gospel plan, the cults have made salvation into a human endeavor. Salvation becomes about what we do. This is false religion and a false gospel and salvation. Okay. So this is, this is way beyond the scope of sovereignty versus free will. If you're thinking, oh, it's just a matter of sovereignty and free will, you know, I mean, he's going to go there. I've already got that fig. No, <laughs> this is way beyond that. I'm not even dealing with that. Restorationism is adding works to salvation and claiming to be the only saved church. So this is far more than just about this one verse or baptism or Calvinism versus uh, uh, Arminianism, <laughs> way more. We're talking about a false gospel here. Just want to throw that in there in case you're thinking that's what I'm talking about. So if you've been through my five videos on the five solas of the Reformation, you are rock solid on the fact that the gospel, the good news about salvation, is foundational to everything else. It is because of this essential reality that Satan and his followers are always attacking the gospel. If they can get you off track on the gospel, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, then everything else gets messed up. Assurance gets messed up. Eternal security gets messed up. Born again. Order of salvation. And so Satan is relentless in, in attacking the gospel. False religion always gives us little things for people to do in order to be saved. Why? Well, it's easy. And here are some steps. Oh my gosh, whoa, that's all it is? You don't have to change your character and your life. Just conform with the religious behavior pattern. Get the merit badges, get dunked. The religious flesh is still in control and on the throne. And like I said many times, if the way to get into the body of Christ is through faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, and you have to come to Christ empty-handed, then the very real specter of people not even being born again is extremely relevant and true. There's a lot, a lot of dead men walking in these cults. Okay. So what about the grammar of Acts 2.38? Let's get back to that. Okay. Grammar of Acts 2.38. And we'll go back and forth between proofs, theology, uh, reasoning, and grammar here, but mostly grammar. The dictionary tells us about a dozen uses of the preposition for, uh, of the preposition for, 
Okay, about a dozen uses. The Church of Christ are simply wrong to think that ice always means in order to or in order to obtain. Okay, again, ice is that uh, Greece wor Greek word for the preposition for. Okay. Theology guides our exegesis and tells us that the word does not mean in order to. Okay. So, according to Bob L. Ross, Campbellism, its history and its heresy and its heresies. Great book. I suggest you read it. The word ice is used in the Bible about 1,700 times. So, the Church of Christ says 1,750. Bob Ross says 1,700. Okay, whatever. According to Ross, no Greek lexicon ever gives the in order to as the primary or even secondary meaning of ice. Ross, a historian, puts data in his book, such as the debate between J.B. Moody and Harding, and I'm assuming this is the Harding that founded the Harding uh, Church of Christ School, anyhow, or the president. Okay, the debate between Harding and Moody, where it revealed just how few times ice is rendered in order to, in different Bible translations. It was pointed out that the Campbellite translator, apparently that's Harding, could only assign the in order to meaning of ice 20 times, 20 times out of 1,700 and 1,700. Campbell in his Living Oracles, uh, memoirs or writing or whatever, Living Oracles, has just four occurrences of the in order to meaning of ice. Okay? <laughs> that means 1,696 do not mean that. King James, translating ice 48 different ways, has no in order to meaning for ice. This is grasping at straws, folks. And this is Ross, the Nashville debate, page 270. So if you want to, he's a historian, he's quoting. This comes from the Nashville debate, page 270. Okay, so the restorationists would have you believe that the church went apostate and fell away shortly after the death of the apostles and suddenly woke up when Alexander Campbell theorized this verse meant that baptism procures the literal remission of sins and that water baptism was necessary for obtaining salvation. And all this despite the fact that the apostle Paul taught that baptism is a work and is not part of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 1.17 and Romans 1.16, okay? The Restoration Movement cults view baptism as a necessary component in addition to repentance and faith that completes the work of salvation. Their teaching says that the person goes into the baptistry dead in their sins, unforgiven and unregenerate, a child of the devil, only to come out of the water moments later, a child of God, forgiven, born again, and a new creation. <laughs> That's baptism, baptismal regeneration right there that I've just described. So in order to obtain salvation in the cults, one must rely on someone else to immerse them in order to be saved. This is salvation by human mediators. The cults teach that Peter was the first proponent of baptismal regeneration. Man, he was the first one. That means that no one is genuinely saved until they've been baptized. <laughs> okay, I don't think so. The Church of Christ go even further by stipulating one must be baptized, quote unquote, correctly and have a complete understanding of baptism in order for it to even count. And that's their heresy of baptismal cognizance. A heretic named McGarry came up with that Church of Christ guy around uh, in the late 1800s. Seventh-day Adventists have got their 13 baptismal vows that you must be that you got to sign off in order to have somebody dunk you and save you. International Churches of Christ, aka the Boston Movement, have about eight to 12 indoctrination Bible studies that you must uh, you know overcome, jump through those hoops, and only then. Can somebody dunk and save you? Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm. Uh. Okay, so <clears throat> again, so, some grammar here. So <clears throat> Peter, you know, this is part of Acts 2.38, so let's unpack this a little bit. <clears throat> I am not a Greek scholar, so uh, I'm doing the best I can here, but I've very well researched this. So Peter said, repent and be baptized. Nobody's debating that. 
The repent, however, that's the one condition to receiving the Holy Spirit in that statement. Repent and baptize are not on equal footing. The Church of Christ is going to tell you one fib after, oh, they're all equal, this and that, triple C, copulative, coordinating, con no. Emphasis is on repent. That's the one condition. Of course, that's a faithful repentance. I've already explained that. Let's get to and. And the Church of Christ assuming that therefore salvation is a result of repentance and and water. So they're going to try to hook these up, man. Ball and chain. And they both go together. There's no difference. There's no anything. They go together. Now they're going to be in love with that word and. Oh man, there's hope for our baptismal salvation now. <laughs> and repent and be baptized. So baptism being a symbol of union with Christ, not a baptismal regeneration. So they're getting it wrong on repentance and, and be baptized. So, you know, they're going to go into a bunch of other stuff now, being more and more and more and more confused. Theology guides our exegesis. That was a slide that I've listed before. And uh, that's really true, isn't it? Excuse me. Uh, allergies. And I'm not going to read the whole slide in that uh, uh, gray box. Baptism then is the outward expression of the repentance and faith. That's John Piper. Is baptism necessary for salvation? Okay. And uh, we're going to be talking about faith and repentance. They're invisible, folks. We can't see somebody coming to saving faith. But remember, the cults reject saving faith. It's all external for them. So this is a heart matter. It's a great slide, and it comes from Systematic uh, Theology by Wayne Grudem. Great book. I suggest you get it. Down at the very bottom, here's uh, Professor uh, Dr. Mark Strauss, a chair of the NIV Study Bible Committee, Acts 2.38 in Theology. And uh, you can review that in part 27. Repentance is a synonym for belief or for faith. Okay, so that's why Peter can tell us his audience to believe in Jesus in Acts chapter t 10 instead of calling them to repent as he did in Acts chapter 238. So the repentance includes faith. Okay, and uh, so uh, so on the uh, on the right there, the Word of God does not teach baptismal salvation or baptismal remission. It does not teach that you are to be baptized to be saved. Bullets top to bottom. Baptism does not seal your salvation or accomplish your salvation. Uh, next, it's a public de de declaration and symbol of the work the Lord has already accomplished within the heart of the believer. Therefore, the whole notion of baptismal regeneration contradicts the very meaning and purpose of baptism. The restorationist next bullet have been unsuccessful in using Acts 2.38 as an argument for baptismal regeneration. Next, in the context of the book of Acts, forgiveness is linked to repentance and bapt uh, not baptism. It's linked to repentance, not baptism. Acts 3.19, 5.31, 26.20. Baptism follows, next bullet, baptism follows salvation. Cornelius, Acts 10, 44, 46, 47, 48. Order of salvation, the initial repentance of the sinner, that invisible photo there, is for forgiveness, followed by baptism. Acts 8, 12, 34, 39, 10, 34 to 48, 16, 31 to 33. Some comments. Okay, so this is uh, from Matt Slick of CARM.org. So we're going to get some theologians and uh, experts in here. Uh, let's see. All right, so this is, uh, this is just a statement here. And then I'll get to a quote from Matt Slick. So the Church of Christ and other cults are ecstatic <laughs> over repent and be baptized, man. They're popping the cork and they're just having their little party. Man, repent and be baptized. They assume that these are two things that bring about salvation. Without either one, salvation is impossible, they say. Well, this is their triple C argument of the word and being a copulative coordinating conjunction that joins parts of equal value value well it sounds so smart and authoritative doesn't it ah but the clouds without rain they're a coming folks so this is from uh, matt slick of karm.org let's cue up some matt slick here quote in acts 238 the main verb is metanoesate 
I'm sure I'm getting that wrong, change mind. The aorist direct imperative, a command of metanoia, which means to repent, change mind. This refers to that initial repentance of the sinner unto salvation. The verb translated be baptized is in the indirect passive imperative, a command to receive, hence passive voice in the Greek, a baptizo, which does not give it the same direct command implied in repent. And I'll put the link down in the description box there, karm.org, baptism in Acts 2.38, end of quote. So again, apostolic preaching and evangelistic imperatives are to repent and believe the good news. Theology there, that's Mark 1.15. Repent and believe the good news. God always grants forgiveness when there is repentance. The action of repenting and believing Turning from and turning to is always said to be the means by which salvation is received. God's grace is 100% the grounds for our salvation. Faith, not faith plus, not faith plus baptism, not faith plus Sabbath keeping, not faith plus headdresses or snake handling, faith not faith plus is the instrumental means by which the sinner is able to access salvation through Jesus Christ. Ah, oh, you must be talking about faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone. Yep. Okay, and we're talking about justification before God here, not before men. John the Baptist preached repentance. Jesus preached repentance. The apostles preached repentance. Repent and be baptized are not equal on equal footing. They're not on equal footing. The Church of Christ are taking Acts 2.38 out of context. And that's what a plain reading does. You take things out of context, you atomize, you isolate, and you get things wrong. Here's John MacArthur, Grace to You, Does Baptism Save You? Quote, Peter calls upon them to prove the genuineness of their repentance by submitting to public baptism. In much the same way, our Lord called upon the rich young ruler to prove the genuineness of his repentance by parting with his wealth, Luke 18, 18 through 27. Surely, however, no one would argue from the latter passage that giving away one's possessions is necessary for salvation. Salvation is not a matter of either water or economics. True repentance, however, will inevitably manifest itself in total submission to the Lord's will. Okay, And remember, it's his will that we believe. It's you know, The baptism comes later. You can't connect them both here. And that's what the Church of Christ does. They believe the gospel is something that you do. It's a big source of their confusion. Hence, the Church of Christ is wrong. Baptism is not the time, moment, and place of salvation, but rather we understand there is a difference between cleaning up the outside with a physical procedure using soap and water and cutting away the sinful nature in a spiritual operation of the inner being. Spiritual repentance baptism, belief and repentance, remember, are one invisible action in the heart. That's what brings the remission of sins. God spiritually circumcised our hearts, Colossians 2.11. 2, and that's what John the Baptist preached, Mark 1.4. In order to be acceptable to God, one must undergo a spiritual circumcision of the heart, the cutting away of our sinful nature. Again, that's repentance and faith, conversion. It's invisible, that initial conversion, when we're initially born again. So in keeping with the pattern presented through scripture concerning New Testament baptism, this is what MacArthur says, John MacArthur, quote, it is the public sign or symbol of what has taken place on the inside. It is an important step of obedience for all believers and should closely follow conversion. And the NIV study Bible notes say the same thing, super important inside it's for believers, this baptism, and it follows conversion, that invisible cutting away. So anyhow, so anyhow, let's see. 
Yep, NIV Bible notes stay, say the same thing, Acts 2.38, and all Christian New Testament baptism is a believer's baptism. There's no such thing as baptismal remission. I'm sorry, folks. Not in the way the Church of Christ is pre presenting it. So, in separating ritual, water baptism, from reality, spirit baptism, says MacArthur, quote, in fact, the need for baptism would contradict the entirety of Christ's ministry. As John MacArthur puts it, quote, after condemning the ritualistic religion of the scribes and Pharisees, our Lord would hardly have institute one, instituted one of his own, end of quote. So again, there's no way, no way that a ritual could save you or H2O or the time, moment, and place and all this other cultic little jargon and canned arguments of the International Church of Christ and the other new birth baptism cults. <laughs> it's impossible. So much, so, so much for the five steppers. Real or true baptism is spirit baptism, which saves. Water baptism typically follows and is a symbol of our previous forgiveness, cleansing, and death to sin. Cults confuse the ritual with the reality. Well, MacArthur also continues, and he says of Acts 2.38, quote, what Peter says here, he says, repent, repent. He fires it out. And it's an aorist, which, aorist, which is an act that is in, the, in, a, in a moment. It's an act that is in a moment. It's an immediate thing. Complete turning in an instant. Salvation is not a question of education. Salvation is not a process. It's an act that happens in a moment. And I think too little we preach repentance. End of quote. Translation, salvation is not a five-step formula. <laughs> so this is really, really hard, all joking aside. It was hard for me many, many years in the Church of Christ, the Independent Christian Church and the International Churches of Christ. I had been misled so many times. It took me quite a long time to finally get to the point where I could study this passage out. But it's really hard for a ritualist and a five-stepper to fathom what I'm talking about here. And only the Holy Spirit can reveal this to somebody. You really have to be seeking and wanting this to be ready. They've been told all their life that the only way to God is by doing little things. And as I just said, the Church of Christ and many of the cults get hung up on the word and here too. Repent and be baptized. What about the Church of Christ? Triple C. Copulative coordinating conjunction joining equal parts. Well, let's talk about the triple C here and how they misunderstand and. They're just giddy about and because it's connected to baptism and then they're going to connect that to remission of sins. Anyhow, so what about this triple C thing? And at this point states MacArthur, quote, the ritualist, the ritualists define their weapon, assuming that therefore salvation is a result of repentance and water, end of quote. Remember the rule that I spoke to you about, folks? Never get your theology from any one salvation narrative in the book of Acts. These are summaries of speeches. These are historical narratives. We must look to the entirety of God's word and use the simple, clear passages to help us understand the more complex. That's a ba basic rule that the cults deny. They've got eyes only for Acts 2.38. Never mind that it's a historical narrative. So let's move on from the Church of Christ misunderstanding of repent and be baptized. Again, they're not on equal footing as salvation is given at the moment of one's initial repentance. So here's yet another grammatical problem. This is where one error leads to another error. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the, for, for the remission of sins. Now, this is where Pat Campbellites get confused because they say repent and be baptized for the remission of sins in order that your sins may be, might be forgiven, which must mean that baptism comes after forgiveness. You, you've got to be baptized in order to be forgiven. Brushed aside is the fact that baptism is a work and has nothing to do with obtaining salvation. New Testament baptism follows justification. 
and imputation. So, and even more difficult for the longtime cultist to comprehend, the Spirit of God is not given in water baptism. We should connect the gift of the indwelling. We shouldn't. We should not connect the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit with water, but with the repentance. Super important. Cults steer folks away from what really saves, repentance, and the Church of Christ slash Restoration Movement will invariably find the scripture that accommodates their ritual. The, the, the theology of ritualistic baptism is nothing new. There are some Campbellites who believe you're saved by water, that it's the time, moment, and place of salvation, while others would say, well, it's a combination of faith plus water. There's a little nuance there. Either way, they're promoting and believing a false gospel. God always grants forgiveness when there is repentance. Baptism is not essential for salvation, but it is essential for obedience. All new converts should be baptized. Okay, so super important. They're getting this all connected and they're coming up with this little formula and they're getting it all wrong here. One thing leads to another. And like Peter in Acts 2.40, you know, I say the same thing. Save yourself. Save yourself. Embrace grace fully and receive the salvation that Christ freely provides. Well, how do you do this? You repent and you can show the sincerity of your repentance and acceptance of the gospel message by being baptized. Repentance is the basis for your baptism. In the New Testament, Christian baptism was only for those who had repented and thus converted. Therefore, baptism was not the basis of their repentance, but their repentance was the grounds of their baptism. We should never confuse the fruit of repentance with repentance itself. To add anything to faith, even baptism, is work salvation in a false gospel. Okay, works and words in all languages have. Now, there's some Greek on the right. It's all Greek to me, right? Ah, Greek. Oh. Church of Christ view, number one. The common ordinary meaning plain reading. That's what they hold to. The Greek preposition ice commonly means in order to. That's all they're going to entertain. They're not going to look at anything else. A plain reading is all they're going to do. But the evangelical Protestant view entertains a frequent meaning that's different from the ordinary. The Greek preposition ice frequently means with reference to. And you'll never hear. I've never heard the Church of Christ mention that. They always go to this third meaning and bash this meaning. They feel comfortable bashing this one for some reason and avoid two, the frequent uh, use. But three, a rare meaning. All language uh, words in all languages also have a rare meaning, different from both the others. The Greek preposition ice rarely means because of. And this is from the theory of baptismal regeneration by B.H. Carroll. Okay, that's where I'm getting that. So anyhow, um, so there's a common meaning a frequent meaning and a rare meaning of, cert, of words in all languages. And that's, I think, it's kind of important to know. And I'll put the link down in the description box, The Theory of Baptismal Regeneration by B.H. Carroll. So when to depart from the ordinary meaning, uh, three pr principles of interpretation. And um, so one, uh, let's see, when, when to depart. Number one, the bearing of the local context. So you got to consider context, but again, plain reading rejects all that. Two, the bearing of the general context. By general context, meaning the trend of the whole Bible teaching, or what is called the canon or the rule of faith. Again, the five souls, but again, the Restoration Movement, Churches of Christ, and the other cults reject the five souls. They reject the Reformation. Remember, the church went apostate. There's a great apostasy in the first century. Woke up 1,800 years later under the auspices and the command and the authority of William Miller, who became the Millerite, Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, woke up under the great ideas and the discoveries of Alexander Campbell, right? In 18, I can't even get the dates right, but anyhow, 1823, he discovered the gospel plan. 1827, it was implemented. That's what they teach, guys. They, they reject all the creeds all the giants of the faith, all the theological eras. And three, 
the nature or congruity of things. So you've got to look at the nature of God, the nature and the language of grace, the story of redemption. You do not need any more than these three principles, says uh, B.H. Carroll. Uh, when you come to study the Greek preposition in the New Testament to enable you to know whether to give it, it, I think, will give in its ordinary, frequent, or rare meaning. So we're going to be talking about ordinary, frequent, and rare meanings, and this will be fun, uh, probably in the next uh, video. All right, so here's a little bit. I'm just going to I think this is uh, finishing it up. Yep, sure. Um, so Acts 2.38 in the grammar, ice, uh, a little Greek word, has three possible meanings, options one, two, or three. And you'll have to come to your own conclusions about this. Um, again, if you want to believe that uh, the number one, in order to get or become or have or keep, if you want to believe the Church of Christ rendering of that, you're welcome to. Uh, you'll be believing a false gospel false man-centered gospel and salvation. So I'm putting that no, uh, that's a sacrament, sacramentarian interpretation. That's the ritualist. And that's the common ordinary meaning, a plain reading that ignores context and author intent. So, you know, two in reference to, okay, that's a frequent meaning in reference to. And for some reason, I don't I didn't see any theologians, any Church of Christ material. Of course, I'm not going to buy their books, but any of them even acknowledge that there's a frequent meaning, meaning in reference to. So since any one of the three meanings could fit the context of this passage, additional studies required in order to see which one is correct, um, the third meaning being because of or as the result of. That's a rare meaning. That's known as causal or retrospective ice that points back to an early event that has already occurred. That's possible. So one is impossible, not if you want to stay within the uh, box of orthodoxy and within Christian doctrine and teaching. One is a no, two, definitely. Um, and uh, number two, I've got at the bottom there, see that uh, blue ribbon? I know this is kind of a little, I'm running out of room in this slide because I tried to include uh, gotquestions.org here and that little article, which inspired a lot of this, by the way. I love gotquestions.org. Anyhow, here's the purposeful sense of ice. This is the one that I can't find any Church of Christ even acknowledging. And, you know, they do that because they can't defend it. This is this is my winner, winner, chicken dinner here. Acts 2.38, baptism for, meaning with regard to, or with a view to, or in light of, or in reference to, or with respect to the forgiveness of your sins. So likely and meaningful. So one, no. Two, uh, frequent, yes. And three, uh, rare, also yes. But uh, let's see. And uh, I, like I said, I'll, I'll hit this slide in the next series. So let's review part 29 and then call it a day. So about a dozen cults came online during the 1800s when Restoration Movement co-founders Stone Campbell Scott discovered the lost gospel and then restored it. They fell prey to what Bible interpreta interpreters call eisegesis. Alexander Campbell theorized that Acts 2.38 was a mandate for a new teaching on salvation, baptismal regeneration, also known as baptismal justification. No one could be considered a Christian who was not baptized according to his viewpoint on Acts 2.38. Two, this superstitious and magical theology and other restoration movement beliefs caught on quickly and were absorbed to various degrees by the Millerites, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and Christadelphians. This sacramental view of baptism had man holding the keys to salvation with control and manipulation being commonplace. Three, the practitioner of such foolishness is mostly unaware that they've been taken captive. They are asymptomatic carriers of the virus of man-centered and works-based religion and are, un and are unknowingly spreading it to others. Four, in order to protect and harmonize the false set of beliefs piped out by the restoration movement, the cultist must explain away or simply ignore many Bible passages, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that teach justification by faith alone, not baptism or any other ordinance or ritual as the standard. And five, this is new here due to the grammar section that we're delving into, five. 
the Church of Christ are simply wrong to think that the little Greek word ice always means in order to or in order to obtain. Okay. They also ignore context by insisting repent and be baptized are on equal footing. In Acts 2.38 then, what is baptism? So here's a question here. So they're not on equal footing. So let me change my tone of voice here. So in Acts 2.38 then, what is baptism's reference to, re reference to remission? Or in what sense does baptism remit sin? And these are questions that are certainly good to ask, aren't they? Here's the answer. Water baptism, Romans 6, 5, is a picture of spiritual baptism, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and is not the point of salvation or the literal remission of sins. Belief and repentance are one invisible action of the heart. That is what brings the remission of sins. God spiritually circumcised our hearts, Colossians 2.11. So, casualties of war at defending the restoration movement, bad theology on baptism and salvation. Well, obviously the gospel, that's the first casualty. Baptismal regeneration is a false gospel. Well, how about new birth at the moment of repentant faith? I walk the plank, me matey. Whoa, well... How about the order of salvation? Ah, it's fish food for you, me bucko. Whoa. Well, how about the Bible doctrine known as saving faith or living faith? I mean, certainly nobody would question that faith, faith is alive at the moment of its inception, right? Hi, give no quarter and show no mercy. Whoa. Well, folks, be warned. Beware. Jesus said you'll know them by their fruits. Finally, the Holy Spirit does not cooperate with the formation of the invented system and doctrines of the cults, even if much of what they teach is orthodox. If you want to be a modern-day Campbellite or an Adventist or an International Church of Christer, that's fine, but don't make it a requirement to be saved by and damn everybody else, because that's just what they do. That's it on the topic of American Cult Christianity, Part 29. Thank you for viewing, and be sure to check out my website and ebook series on the International Church of Christ at www.sparrowministry.com, or order the books directly from Amazon.com or my Amazon.com author page. And they're also available on Apple Books, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, and Rakuten. And if you don't have a Kindle device, no problem. The website has other formats that will work on your PC, smartphone, Chromebook, and tablet.